Hello, and welcome to the Accountability Coach Podcast, where we discuss proven business success principles related to helping you make more money and work less so you can enjoy having your ideal business and ideal life. This is Ann Backrack. Today we have a special guest with us who I think you will find to be helpful in getting us to have a fighter pilot mentality so we can more quickly get to our next level of success. Dominic Tyke brings his fighter pilot background and applies them to guide pilots, athletes, business owners with afterburner techniques that American fighter pilots use to ensure mission completion. Slice, as his call sign, is the author of Single Seat Mindset. As an Amazon best-selling author, business owner, entrepreneur, civilian, and military instructor pilot, he knows that busy individuals struggle with information overload. He has a proven formula you will want to hear. Welcome, Dom. I appreciate you joining us. Thank you, Anne. Looking forward to uh, helping business owners and professionals with some actionable tips to make them more successful. I know you've got them and I'm looking forward to it as well. And as you know, I like to just jump right in and get to the meat. So let's start off with what is the process for becoming a fighter pilot that has actually helped you the most at being a successful entrepreneur? Yeah, so the 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 first thing that kind of comes to mind for me is you know what I've seen in in athletes and and kind of peak performers is that uh, when you're when you're a goal oriented individual or you operate in groups that exhibit those those high level of um, success. So whether you're a fighter pilot or a professional athlete or you know I mean you could probably throw in any slew of of different professions there, but those types of individuals, um, especially myself, I get frustrated when there's when there's just slow processes and rigid structures that I can't control, and there's there's protocols, there's no deliverable outcome. And what I noticed is that um, fighter pilots, through our training, um, we, we make split decisions at 800 plus miles an hour, and those decision making skills, those process making skills that we learn, they're incredibly useful in high performance professions. And that's kind of what led us to, to build the largest online group of fighter pilots. We're trying to help business owners, athletes, entrepreneurs to avoid failure and control a direct road to success. And through that, th that process, um, it's very simple. It's um, something that we learn as fighter pilots and as aviators, and that's plan, execute, debrief. Those three things. So putting together a plan um, and then executing that plan. And then the most important piece of that is debriefing the plan to, and that's where you're going to really pull out those lessons learned because a lot of times in business, what I've found is when you start a business, business owners like to start other businesses. And if you've really taken the time to debrief yourself on your lessons learned, when you start your next business, it should be easier. So we can, we can kind of unpack a couple more little nuggets out of the plan, execute, debrief framework, um, or we can move on if you want. But I think the the debrief portion is incredibly overlooked by a, by a long shot. It was it was an overlooked piece of the the learning process until I became an aviator and a fighter pilot, specifically a military fighter pilot. Um, that was something that you know is it's painful at times, right? Because that's when you learn that you failed or or you didn't fail as a person. You the process failed, right? Absolutely. And I couldn't agree with you more about the debrief aspect being super important for basically how we could do things even better. And I think it's an underutilized concept as well. And so it's just, for example, how many people actually record their conversations or record anything, whether it's video or just audio, and then listen to that recording? How painful is that? And then have to figure out, okay, I listened to that painful recording, which most people think is painful. So how do I then get better? How do I do something next time even better to get the result I'm looking for or an even better result? So I'd love for you to unpack that even more. Yeah, so the the how do I get better piece of it is probably what your listeners are doing right now. They're They're listening to podcasts, they're reading books, they're um, you know, they're trying to unpack short and punchy and, and influential 
information that can help them with their next step. Cause they're looking for that. Anytime I'm reading a book, I'm looking for that golden nugget um, to pull out of the book and to go, Oh, that's going to solve this pain point, or that's going to help me with this process that I already have going on. So I think that sometimes if you, if you aren't trained in a, in a profession that is super high performance and, and fast paced, one of the things that you can get really stuck on is the planning portion. So plan, execute, debrief, the first step, right? So if you're an action taker and you're already taking action, the trap is to get stuck in the planning phase and to write this extravagant business plan and to basically get stuck into, you know, what a lot of people call analysis paralysis. I call it figuring where they're just stuck trying to figure out what they're doing next. And, and that can be, you know, a little bit of a shaky area. So I think if you're stuck in that phase of planning and you're, you're doubting your plan and you're doubting yourself, that's a, that's a time to pull in um, potentially a coach or a guide, which is why I started single seat mindset.com. It's a, it's, it's a business, but we give all the money to a children's cancer nonprofit. And that, that business is essentially, we are filling the guide or the coach we're scratching that itch that people are looking for to give them a unique perspective at maybe something that they're um, having a challenge on, right? So we have all of these different perspectives. They're all fighter pilots and they, and they provide this information. And that guide, specifically in the planning phase, can be important because you want to plan enough to get going, right? So then that next step can happen and then you can start executing your plan. And as you execute your plan, that's where you start to, you know, maybe poke some holes in, in what you thought was, you know, what you thought the, the path was supposed to be and to, and to learn kind of on the fly, basically get that on the job training and that, that plan and just, and keep referencing and going back to your plan, but keep executing. Right. And as you're executing at the end of each day or at the end of each process, um, debrief yourself, right? So take notes, record yourself, you know, most of the time, I try not to communicate with, you know, my property managers and my contractors and subcontractors um, via text because I can't go back and reference what I said because there's going to be a lot of communication that goes back and forth. So put it into some sort of medium that you can go back and reference again so that you can then refine and hold people accountable to saying, you know, hey, this is the process. This is the timeline that we agreed to and it's in writing. And you, we can debrief some of the issues that, you know, we maybe came up along the way. So I think to kind of summarize that plan enough to get going, we, we live in this information age where there's just so much knowledge and information that people get stuck trying to create this perfect plan. And as you know, college does not prepare you for the real world. The real world prepares you to live in the real world. So you have to get out there and start executing and and put your plan into action. And then most importantly, debriefing is um, a skill that everybody can learn, you know, that, that is, it's painful, right? Because that's where, like I said before, that's where you, you have learned that maybe your plan initially was not, was not correct. And then that's, that helps you refine your plan the next time, update it, and then execute at a higher level of competency. And then you essentially move your actions into competence and then eventually you strive to to be a genius in your own sphere in your own you know your own business so that would be kind of the biggest thing that i would say is is in the debriefing vein you know plan enough to get going and then action is how you learn so give yourself some on the job training and start executing your plan and then every day go back and debrief yourself on that day and then and then take those lessons learned into the next morning I love that. You talked about analysis paralysis and really the key to me just to getting started is plan enough to get going because so many times people are what I call getting ready to get ready and they never get out of the planning phase to even get to the execution phase because they're getting ready to get ready to do something, yeah. but they never actually enter into the execution phase. So they have nothing to debrief yet because they haven't even gotten out of the planning phase. So yeah. I love that. <laughs> yeah. And I think if you, if you're stuck in that, you know, if, if I was listening to this and I was stuck and I'm like, man, I just, I'm, I'm planning and my plan isn't ready, then sit down and for the next day or week, 
figure out how long it's going to take you to get ready and then put that in writing. Make that part of your plan on day X of whatever year you're in. I am going to put this machine in drive and I'm going to smash that accelerator to the ground and I'm going to get going on this. And when you put a timeline on something that then gives you a sense of urgency throughout your day to meet that timeline and it's self-imposed. And if you go buy it, you know, you go past that timeline, give yourself a break. But, you know, I find that if I get stuck, a lot of times what I'll do is I'll just go, hey, on this date, I'm going to start this project. And then when that date rolls around, if I'm not ready, then I debrief myself. Why wasn't I ready for that? But that I think is, is something it's very simple that you can you can put into action and get going. Yeah. And you talked about a coach to help you with that, because so many times business professionals, entrepreneurs don't have somebody that they're you know, reporting to. So a lot of times we all need a little accountability in our life to really help us jumpstart that. And by reporting to somebody really can make that difference, not only setting the deadline for yourself, but when you have someone you're reporting it to, whether that's a group of people or an individual, it helps really push that forward more so than not. Yeah, and, and yeah. I don't know if you've seen this in, in your business or coaching or, or what have you, but a lot of times, you know, when I was starting out, I did not have that coach or that guide. I didn't, I didn't know who that person was in my life, and I didn't let that stop me because when you start taking action and you're doing things, people will take notice, and the guides and the coaches will kind of come out of the woodwork. So you know, have, have a trusted confidant that can kind of, you can bounce ideas off of and maybe get some input from just because you don't have the perfect coach or guide. Don't let that stop you because those people, as you are, as you're charting your path, they'll kind of come out of the woodwork and, and they'll see that you're taking action. Cause something that turns me off more than anything is a talker. Somebody that's talking about, well, if I would have just done X, Y, and Z, and it's like, well, well then do it, stop talking about it and get going. I'm with you on that one, a hundred percent. Now you've mentioned your book, Single Seat Mindset, and what I'd like to just kind of unpack a little bit is what makes a single seat mindset unique. Yep. So the the company is um, Single Seat Mindset. The book, one of the books, is called Single Seat Wisdom, and they are. It's practical and valuable life advice from American fighter pilots. And each book has 20 individual chapters written by a different fighter pilot. You know, one of them, I'm kind of chuckling right now because I'm looking at it. But chapter 13 in our first volume is written by, he's not only a Top Gun pilot. So not only did he go to the Air Force Top Gun school, he's a Top Gun instructor. And he wrote a chapter on the art of the fighter pilot debrief. And in there, he breaks down very simply with a picture, did you execute the game plan, right? So when you're debriefing yourself, he's even got a little um, spaghetti chart that goes, yes, I did execute the game plan. And then the next question is, did the game plan work? And then it goes into no, why not? And then so he kind of walks you through that process. At the end of the day, you can, you know, flip this book open and just go, okay, what is, uh, what does he say about you know, how do I, how do I effectively debrief myself? Cause a lot of people are just like, well, I, if I've never debriefed, well, how do I learn how to do that? But to kind of get back to your, you know, your, what, why it, that kind of leads into why are fighter pilots, you know, what, what training and, and, and why, like, why should people care to listen to fighter pilots? I think that the big thing there is the, I was a civilian pilot Um, I have an airline transport pilot certification. You know, I've been hired by American Airlines. So I have civilian pilot experience as well as I've been a civilian instructor pilot as well. And I have military instructor experience. And the, the big difference in the military fighter pilot world compared to the civilian pilot is, I mean, one of the big ones, and it's not going to surprise you is speed. All right. And so when you're, when you're going fast, there are, it's not necessary as humans, we can, we can do one thing at a time. So as a fighter pilot, what I learned is not only planning, executing, and then more importantly, debriefing at a much higher level than I did in the civilian world, there's much less tolerance for error. And so every time you fly, there's a 
an expectation from everybody on your team. So because I'm a single seat pilot, I am taking care of everything inside of my jet, but that doesn't mean that I'm an individualistic person. I'm working as a bigger team. Very rarely do we actually fly a fighter jet by ourselves. We employ these jets for America in teams. So whether that's two, four, eight, you know, I've, I've been a mission commander where there were over a hundred different aircraft in the sky at one time. So we're working as a team, but more importantly, the mindset behind that is, I, I think this is something that's very innate to American fighter pilots and, and, and something that I hadn't thought about for a really long time, but we, we like to win. And there, as I step out the door, I'm not really thinking about the ways that I'm going to fail. I'm just thinking about how I execute at the highest level possible that day to win. And then because everything is moving so fast, we have to put the right process in the right in, in the right process or each each execution phase has to fit in the right process. Right. So if I'm if I'm looking at my checklist for the landing phase of the aircraft and I just took off, well, I'm putting something in the wrong order. Right. So I think the big thing for me was not only the plan, execute, debrief portion of being a fighter pilot, but then learning in our high performance environment through our training, through multiple deployments, you know, large force employment exercises, being a mission commander is, hey, what is next? Not only we call it near rocks and far rocks. So what's the next step that helps us get closer to the finish line? And then what are the far rocks? Like what are the things that are going to be out way out in front of us as I start to catch my breath, go, hey, what down the road might bite me, but then not forget about the next thing right in front of my face. And so I think that is kind of the the biggest thing that that I learned as a fighter pilot is is more how how to plan. But then more importantly, what do I need to do right now? If I'm in a boat and there's an alligator right next to me and there's one 20 feet away, I need to worry about the alligator that's closest to me. That one 20 feet away, I know he's there. I'll have a plan for that. But if I die from this one here close to me, that's what's going to really derail my plan. No kidding. That definitely is going to derail your plan for sure. How would someone use other fighter pilot knowledge that you've developed and learned to help them be even more successful in their business and in their personal life? Any thoughts on that? Yeah, so um, I think there's a couple of things. We can talk about the competent wingman program that we started. Um, but I think more importantly, if I was you know, driving to work right now and I was listening to this, I'd go, what is, what is one thing? that I can start doing today as a business owner or, hey, I'm an employee, but I want to be an entrepreneur and I want to start my own business. The thing that helped me, the one thing that helped me more than anything in my life was, and this is crazy because it's so simple, I started going to bed early and not crazy early, like 6 p.m. I just started going to bed earlier. And the importance behind that was as I started to go bed to bed earlier, I stopped watching shows. I stopped looking at social media. I stopped using those hours of the day to essentially waste time, frankly, is what I was doing. And I just told myself, I'm going to wake up five minutes early tomorrow morning and I'm going to sit in silence. I'm going to meditate. I'm going to pray. I'm going to formulate my, my intention for the day. If I look back at the end of the day and I go, hey, I had this plan today and it worked, whether that was, you know, it could even be spending more time with the family, but I look back, I don't want any regrets at the end of the day. So for, for me personally, the one thing that I started doing was going to bed earlier um, because then you won't stay up and, you know, maybe have another beer or eat a bag of chips or whatever. And as you, as you go to bed earlier, you wake up more refreshed. And in the morning hours, at one point, I had little kids that would wake up at 5.15, 5.30 in the morning. So I was getting up at 3.45 and 4 in the morning to get the couple hours of work done in the morning. And by the time that I actually went into work for my fighter pilot job, at times I would have three or four hours of work done on my business early on in the morning that I was just wasting at, you know, in the afternoon. So I think that is one of the biggest things that helped me was just going to bed early because you can choose that normally outside of it, maybe a shift work job, but even then you can just choose to maybe get a couple extra bits of sleep. And then as you wake up the next morning, you're more refreshed. 
you have that quiet, um, man, that just magical quiet time in the morning to kind of formulate your own plan. Cause I always, I always tell the young lieutenants that are learning how to fly as I'm like, if you go into the fighter squadron and you don't have a plan for your day, the first person that outranks you, which is almost everybody will give you their plan for the day because they've already thought about it and they've been doing it longer than you. So if you don't have a plan going into your day, then how do you know how to debrief your plan at the end of the day? And if you're not rested, you don't give yourself that time in the morning, then how do you know it worked? I, I totally agree with you. According to sleep experts, most, most people go through life sleep deprived anyway. And how can you be 100% present at whatever you're going to do? And especially as a fighter pilot, you need to be 100% present at what you do. And as a business owner, we also have to be 100% present at what we do to get the outcomes that we're looking for. And for me, I actually stopped watching the news <laughs> probably at least 15 or more years ago because the reality is, is that and I don't remember exactly the ratios. It's like one positive story to every 17 negative stories because negative <laughs> is, you know, what people watch. And I thought, I just don't want to be angry, upset, pissed off, unhappy by watching all the negativity that, you know, is filled with the news. So I just stopped watching it. And if somebody if there's something that I need to know, somebody will say, have you heard? And I said, well, no, tell me about that. So I'll get news just by people wanting to tell me something. I don't actually have to watch all the negativity and I get all that time back. And I think that's pretty cool. I didn't I didn't think of that. And because about, I don't know, probably six or seven years ago, I started doing the same thing. Just I stopped watching the news because it was all junk anyways. Right. You, you don't you don't turn on the news and they say Southwest Airlines had 30,000 successful flights this past month. They say an irate passenger decided to throat punch another passenger on the airplane, which led to a diversion and a landing in a different city. And look at all these people that got upended, right? So I, I really like that. Um, I think that's something that I'll start talking to people a little bit more about. But then you had mentioned sleep. And I, I was reading a book because I'm not, I'm not one that would be enlightened enough to just know this, right? So, But a lot of times I get a lot of pushback from people when I say, well, just wake up earlier in the morning. And if earlier in the morning is just five minutes earlier, just start with that. And people are like, well, I'm just not a morning person. Well, I, so not, probably not surprisingly, most people, they did a big survey and most people are not morning people, or at least when they checked it off on the block. So, you know, at being able to learn things, um, you know, our brains are plastic, they're moldable. We can learn these traits. You can learn fighter pilot techniques and strategies and processes and not be a fighter pilot, just like an athlete can learn that stuff. No, nobody gets in a fighter jet for the first time and is just good at it. It doesn't happen. So you can learn these things. And if you're not a morning, quote unquote, morning person, then make yourself a morning person. Cause I was not, I didn't like waking up early. I was the type of guy that woke up and I woke up just enough time to throw my clothes on and get out the door to get to work on time. And that just leads to a very hectic day because there's no plan going into your day. You're just triaging and putting out fires all day long. And it's, it's incredibly exhausting. So I think if you're one of those people that's like, I don't want to wake up earlier, well, why don't you just tell yourself, I'm going to give this a shot for six months, maybe a year, and I'm going to wake up five minutes earlier every single day. I'm going to go to bed 30 minutes early and get some extra sleep and see what, see what happens. Absolutely. And I think also, you know, when you wake up, there's so many better ways to wake up than, hey, checking email, watching the news, doing all the things that are really not going to mentally and emotionally start your day out right. And I think, you know, I think you mentioned gratitude or, you know, meditation or things like that that really help set you up to have the kind of day that really you should have, need to have, and want to have, as opposed to, like you said, putting out fires, running by the seat of your pants all day, and feeling like you're behind. That's yeah. like being on a hamster wheel, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. The, the, the mind, body, spirit aspects of our existence, I find that our culture really props up the mind, learning, listening to podcasts, reading books, going to college, the body part of it, go, you know, look good, work out, all that stuff. But then we largely ignore the spiritual aspects of life that are very real. And those, I'm not saying that you need to be a, like a deeply religious person. I'm, 
I do think there is value in that. But if you're not, the spiritual aspects of it, just sitting in silence, meditating, think about your day. And you had mentioned just kind of avoiding that, that helps you avoid this feeling that you've then woken. You, you're awake. You're not woke, but you are actually awake and you're stepping onto your 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 this this uh, day that you're going into. You're not jumping into a hamster wheel that you don't control. And that's that's what I was saying. I hinted that earlier. If you don't have a plan going into your day, the first person that you see is going to give you their plan for that day. And you may not like it. Absolutely. Let, let's say that we have a plan, we're executing the plan, it's not working the way we want it to, so it's looking like it's going to be, quote, a failure. So I'm assuming that through your training, there are ways that fighter pilots go into not accepting failure as an option. How would we do that? Yeah, so if you're familiar, I'm sure you are with Tony Robbins, a lot of people, I mean, he's been out there, but one of his, one of my favorite quotes of his is failure, maybe him or Zig Ziglar or one of the bigger minds in the world, but is failure is an event, not a person. And I may be misquoting the person, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but failure being an event, not a person. So if you fail, um, I think it was Nelson Mandela that actually said, I don't, I only what do you say? I, I win or I learn, meaning when you fail, consider that a learning experience and take those lessons learned and debrief yourself because it's painful, right? Because a lot of us, even, you know, I think men specifically think that they are very logical. They start out very logically, but it's, that couldn't be further from the truth. As humans, we, we start out on a feel basis. So how do we feel about a decision that we're about to make? And then we back it up with logic. Well, when you fail, it, that is that hits you right in the feels and it and it hurts and it if you run from that feeling and you run from that pain you are avoiding the most important lessons that you could have learned for what just happened right and so as you are walking your business journey or learning you are going to have failures in fact i think michael jordan his i don't know but it was it was much less than 50% uh, he, he had much less than a 50% chance of making a basket. And I think it was even lower than that. It was like maybe high 20s or in the 30%. So one of the best basketball players to ever walk the face of the planet is failing more than 50% of the time. Every time he shoots a basketball, it's not preventing him from starting. He just learns from it. So I don't know if that answered your question, but the the thing that I, I think that would we'd be beneficial to know is fighter pilots, we don't necessarily know that we're going to win every single time. We go in with a pretty good plan and we go in and sometimes you lose pretty hard and you, you come back and you're like, how did, what, where did the wheels fall off the bus here? But part of that is, is learning it and, and kind of, you know, and it's very difficult because as a young guy, I struggled with this a lot was putting my humility hat on and just accepting the fact that I really screwed up that day. And it took me many years to learn that. Some guys are better at it than, than me, but man, that took me a long time to learn. And that is so helpful of not you know, go towards the pain and the fear and go, why, why, why did I have that pain that day? And in, in my, when I started my real estate business, I had, <laughs> there were a couple of people or a couple of people that I needed to fire and rehire. And that was my accountant, my property managers, and then I didn't have a foreman running my construction project. So those were my big three pain points. And it took me a while to get to them. It took me about six months to go every, at the end of every day, I was just always dealing with accounting issues, with job site issues, because my, um, I, was, I was basically the general contractor and I didn't have a person running that for me. And then as a property manager, that's just a very busy body type thing to do. And it takes a special person to do that. And I wasn't that person. So I, sat down one day and just go, man, why, why at the end of every day am I so pissed off and I'm afraid of going into tomorrow and what are those things? And I, as soon as I identified those things, that's when I actually started to see a lot of the acceleration that I was looking for uh, when I got on my own way. Yeah, you definitely answered the question. And I think really it comes down to viewing our setbacks or you know, air quotes, failures, whatever you might want to call them as lessons to really learn and grow. 
Yeah. So yep. it's really just a mindset. Hey, that's not necessarily a failure. Boo hoo. Let me go cry and sit in my corner. And I believe you can have a five minute pity party, but then you put your big boy and big girl pants on and you say, okay, what are my lessons that I need to learn here? So this doesn't happen again and I can actually accelerate my results. Yeah. And it's, and it, and that, that piece of that is even more impactful. I've found a lot of people don't like journaling, so call it something different. Call it scribing, call it taking notes. You need to write it down and you need to review those at least on a week weekly basis. Review your past because a lot of the challenges that you were having a week ago, I do this all the time. The, the very next week I'll read my notes and what I thought was a challenge last week is now no longer a challenge because you wrote it down, it became part of your subconscious and then you are looking for ways subconsciously your brain is in the background looking for ways to navigate those challenges that you have through your day so if you are not a person that takes notes or writes things down start doing it because i did that for a number of years and i found out that when i was trying to get new clients and raise raise some more money for another uh, real real estate investing deal i was spending a lot of time trying to capture a new client versus just taking my notes i my first book that I wrote, it's called Single Seat Investor, is basically a culmination of many years of notes that I distilled down into a page that can't be, or a book that can't be any more than 150 or 200 pages. But it's basically what we were doing in my company, Viper Ventures. And so when somebody would say, hey, I want to be a passive investor in your company and invest in multifamily real estate, well, then I'd go, thank you for asking. I really appreciate that. And I would hand them a book. And then they could learn what we were doing in our business to see if they fit our business model. And wrapping that whole point up, I wouldn't have done that had I not taken notes. Had I not written it down, I wouldn't have known where to start and I wouldn't know where the pain points are. I wouldn't have known any of that stuff. And you know, I was spending about two to three hours with every investor, taking them to lunch and figuring out you know, what what pain points they had. And I took all of those notes and I just put it into one book and I, it answered probably 95% of all of the passive investors questions because I had just been keeping notes for all of those conversations that we had had over the years. That's great. I love that concept. And I think, and I hope that more people will start doing that because I think it's super valuable to do. Okay. So you probably get this question a lot, but I don't know the answer, so I'm going to ask you this question. Okay. Out of curiosity, how did you get the fighter pilot call sign of Slice? Yep, so in this is a thing that many fighter pilot groups do all over the world. I mean, I've flown with Australians, Europeans, you know, people in Japan and Korea, and generally what you'll find is that a fighter pilot will have a call sign and it's just like any maybe tight knit group that you grew up in, you're going to get, you're going to get named, you're going to get a nickname. And generally speaking, from what I've found is that you don't get to give you your own name. So it's typically given to you by the collective group. And oh, by the way, you may not like it. And then additionally, it's usually not a name that you get because you're really, really cool. Usually it's because you did something stupid. So in my case, I got, I do like to golf a lot. It's not because I slice but it's because on my first very high G sortie that I was flying against a very um, experienced instructor pilot, um, I was a young guy and we had taken off, we had done basically what people know as dog fighting, right? So we're, we're trying to find and then shoot another aircraft before it shoots us type of thing. So I had, Flown that morning, we had landed, we had gotten gas in the pits, so we basically leave the jets running and then they gas us up on the ground and we take off again. So I had, I was feeling pretty good and on the last set that we did, I, the, the fight, if you will, was going vertical. So we were going pr pretty nose high. I got my weapons cued in time and I was shooting the other aircraft, simulated of course, and we have these things called training rules, right? So in debrief, you can look back and go, hey, black and white, like, did you break this training rule? And those training rules are just that. They're, they're to prevent you from killing yourself. Well, I broke a training rule. So I was pointing at the other aircraft too long 
and it so happened too. Th I'll, I'll take the ownership for this. It was my fault, but the instructor pilot also was pointing at me as well. And we had a very close pass. We almost hit each other and fast forward a couple of weeks. We're doing the naming ceremony and all the fighter pilots are there. And after a couple of names came up and um, throughout some uh, deliberation, they uh, opted to give me the call sign slice because I tried to slice my uh, instructor pilot in half. So that's kind of where that comes from. And I was in a Japanese squadron at the time, so it kind of fit the the full tang ninja sword uh, motif that we had going on. <laughs> you laugh, but it was, it like was painful, that. right? Because I, I was that idiot be, that almost died. <laughs> it has to be painful, but I like the whole analogy of with, you know, the Japanese, you know, fighter pilot and, and all that. So uh, that's really an interesting concept and an interesting story. I love that. Now, I really appreciate you also, you have offered to give away three signed copies of your book, Single Seat Wisdom, Volume 1, to the first three listeners. Correct. Right? So how do Correct. they do that? They are going to go to... Yep. So the main website is singleseatmindset.com. So singleseatmindset.com, and then it is an unlisted link. So when you go to singleseatmindset.com, you just put a forward slash in there, and it's just one word, all lowercase, podcast gift, podcast gift. So singleseatmindset.com forward slash podcast gift. And on there, just click on the little button and you throw your name and information in there. And um, like I said, this business, Single Seat Mindset, we give all the money to a children's cancer nonprofit. So part of our strategy is to give back. And so no questions asked, we will uh, we'll send you drop a physical copy of um, Single Seat Wisdom uh, in the mail for anybody in the U.S. If you live outside the U.S., um, just reach out to me and, and, and we'll see what we can do for that. No, I appreciate that. So if you just reference the Accountability Coach podcast and put in Single Seat Mindset or so if you go to singleseatmindset.com forward slash podcast gift. Three people will get a signed copy of that. As long as you live in the United States, they'll send that for free. Obviously, if you live outside the United States, it's only fair to pay the shipping and handling for that. And I understand that because it can be very costly in some places. So super appreciate that special gift and offer. Any last parting comments that you'd like to share that you think we really need to know? Yeah, I would say that the last thing there is you when you start out, don't be afraid of this achievement hamster wheel, you know, get getting going and taking action. It will be tiring at times, um, but that's, that's how you learn. If you, if you take the time and you sit down and you debrief yourself, that would be the biggest thing there is, Hey, if I'm on this, I remember golfing one day and I just told my friend, I'm, I'm like, I am stuck on this achievement hamster wheel. I'm just achieving things, but I don't know where success is and I don't know where I'm going. And I, I, that day, on hole 14, when we teed off, I was like, I'm done with this. I'm, I'm done with this hamster wheel of life. And that's when I stopped, you know, looking at social media every morning and watching the news, doing all the stuff that you had already highlighted in this show and going to bed early and making all, all of those things happen. So I, if, if you're thinking about starting a business or if you have started a business and you're in that achievement hamster wheel, I think that's part of the process. Don't fear that. Just grab onto it and and it, you know, over time you will figure out how to uh, remove yourself from that. And then other people will, will jump on that hamster wheel and then you can sit back and kind of coach them through that. Yeah. I mean, we make choices every second of every day. And when you look at it, is that choice that we're making every second of every day really moving us forward or keeping us where we're at? And I think that's what you're saying here is, you know, yes. make a better choice, get off the freaking hamster wheel and make yep. choices that are really moving you forward, not keeping you where you're at. So I appreciate Perfect. you sharing your insight with us, your wisdom with us and, and your very valuable time. I certainly took a lot of notes and got a lot of value from everything that you learned in being a fighter pilot and transitioning those concepts into being a successful entrepreneur. Thank you, Anne. I really enjoyed it. Well, my hope for our time together with Dominic is that you got value and an idea or two that will help you be even more successful professionally and personally. 
Feel free to share my podcast with others, as it can be found on most podcast platforms and in most English-speaking countries, and of course, at accountabilitycoach.com. And if you'd like to get a short daily fix from me, subscribe to the Accountability Minute, which can also be found on most podcast platforms and in most English-speaking countries. And remember to subscribe to my Business Success Tips and Resources blog by going to accountabilitycoach.com forward slash blog. And always aim for what you want each and every single day. Until next time, make it a great day, today and every day. I appreciate you listening.